Okay, so hello, welcome all. Uh, so Sanket has given the introduction. So this is one of the research area of mine, which is service recovery and services marketing, uh, which also happened to be my dissertation essay. And so I worked uh, relatively few uh, amount of time in this area, uh, along with, of course, the supply relationship and emerging market strategy. So uh, briefly, this uh, this particular paper falls in the uh, falls in this. Uh, 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 falls in this crossroad of two different strategies altogether. One is basically service recovery, which actually a research that has moved quite uh, vigorously for the last 20, 25 years. And then emerging market strategy, which is a very new area and you know, last 20 years are kind of a golden era of emerging market research, but more or less theoretical underpinnings have slowly started coming in. So it's not, it's a, it's kind of a very new area. So. It's, so I'm try, I try to merge both of them together. So I'll just start my presentation and let me just share my screen with you. Okay. So uh, essentially the top titles, leveraging service recovery strategies uh, to reduce customer churn in the emerging market. So this paper is actually co-authored with Professor Srinivas Prekha, who was my advisor at uh, I am Bangalore, and Professor Amlesh Sharma, who is at May School of Business, Texas A&M University. So, uh, so let me give you some examples. So this is one example. This is a club mat, uh, which is a holiday service to Cancun, Mexico. So one of these trips, right, where you can go to holiday to Cancun, Mexico, started quite poorly. So the flight took off like six hours late. It made, has to make two unexpected stops and also had to make a rough landing. So in, in short, people are kind of very disappointed after they reach Cancun. So because, you know, uh, this is so many bad things happen in the same trip. And if you look at United Airlines, right, the similar incident happened. So this individual, his name is Dave Carroll, and he was traveling from Canada to Nebraska. And during his flight, which was a layover at Chicago, his guitar got broken. And in both the cases, customers actually complained. Uh, but the reactions from both the firms were very, very different. So in case of Club Mad, uh, so they actually did it quite nicely. So the recovery response was they provided snacks and drinks at the airport. They helped passengers with their baggages. So all these things they have done. And if you look at United Airlines, they actually virtually did nothing in despite the person complaining so many times. So what the person did is actually posted a video on YouTube and it has spent around uh, 150,000 hits within a span of only 24 hours. So you can see that service failures are kind of quite, uh, can be quite damaging for the firm reputation. Now, closer to home uh, in 2015, if you remember, this call drop uh, was a big issue. It's still a big issue for most telecom firms. But at that time, there's a joint parliamentary committee that has been coming out about, and also Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, which actually fined tel telecom companies. And they said that if there's a call drop, we should compensate the consumers, of course, Supreme Court finally struck down this uh, ruling, uh, struck down this whatever the tribe came up with. But what happened because of this, their, their share prices fall quite drastically, around 3% as a fall drop in the share price. Now, similarly, if you look at Indigo Airlines, right? So they have been, uh, parliamentary committee has slammed them for rude behavior. In fact, in one case, uh, Indigo flight left, uh, leaving 14 passengers behind because the flight left little early. So these are the kind of failures that are quite common. So service failures across the industry are quite common. And if you look at the consequences of it, uh, the, this is a essential survey in 2015, which suggests that 64% of the consumer switch because of issues associated with customer service. So therefore it is a big deal. And in emerging markets, the situation is even more problematic. So this is uh, again, essential global survey 2015. It said 88% of the customer churn due to service failure related issues in India. And of course, uh, you know, in that particular time, if you look at Latin American top four mobile service provider, mobile network providers, they lost around $30 billion due to customer churn related issues. So therefore it is very important that we kind of address these issues of service failure and recovery, uh, and then uh, try to come up with more applicable strategies for the, for the industry. But if you look at this literature, although there is like a lot of research in this domain, primarily the research is done in developed markets. So I understand that you know simply because the research has been done in developed market, that cannot be a good reason uh, to conduct uh, 
uh, research in emerging market because developed market findings might be very well valid in emerging markets until unless I come up with a good theoretical reason uh, why this is the case. So which I will try to argue later. So therefore, there are almost no research. Only paper that I am aware of is uh, 2015 paper by Barakat, which came in IJRM, International Journal of Research in Marketing. Uh, apart from that, I'm not aware of any other research in which looks at service failure recovery in an emerging market kind of a setup. Uh, the second bigger problem is because it is failure, most companies are very reluctant to share data. As a result of which most of the research is primarily experimented in nature. So what you try to measure is kind of uh, uh, kind of churn intention or you know, uh, or how likely is a churn intention or uh, intention to leave the firm rather than actual churn or actual uh, behavior. So you have behavioral intention rather than behavior. And as we all know, uh, behavioral intention and behavior, actual behavior are not highly correlated as it turned out. So what we know about service recovery may not be adequate enough. So that's another level of challenge we face. The third challenge in this stream of research that people have come up with is that most of the paper that has, they do not distinguish between different types of service failure. So what they assume that all failures are kind of similar. So if you go to a restaurant, for example, in the restaurant, if your uh, food uh, come late, it's treated the same as if, you know, uh, as if you do not get a particular type of dish. Okay? So you went to a restaurant, you order a particular type of dish, you don't get it, there's one kind of failure. On the other hand, if the food comes late, that should be treated, that should be treated separate, second kind of thing. Unfortunately, this distinction has not been made in most of the research. So in summarizing, there are like three major issues that this research domain suffers. No research in emerging market, measuring only intentions to per intention to churn rather than actual churn, and also not distinguishing between different types of failure, recovery kind of scenario. Now, since we do not have much research in this domain and uh, in emerging markets, I'm not aware of any research. So we started off with some interviews of managers. Now, qualitative research uh, to conduct, the reason for con conducting these qualitative interviews is basically to understand what managers think about service failure, what can be the potential consequences they feel in the service failure. Also try to understand what kind of recovery mechanism they kind of deploy when it comes to failure recovery. So if you look at this, I interviewed around 47 managers from four different industries. The industry has been telecom, retail. Uh, we also interviewed from banking and financial services and hospitality. Now the industries are selected with multiple criteria. So for example, two of the industries, which is banking and financial services and uh, uh, banking and financial services and to large extent telecom uh, is kind of more contractual kind of a relationship. On the contrary to that, if you look at hospitality and retailing in India, at least it is primarily non-contractual. So, so that is one of the reasons to understand is there some differences across that. Again, you know, a certain so telecom service providers, you may not meet the service provider face to face. Contrary to that, when it comes to banking or hospitality, it is much close contact. So you're going to meet the service providers, right? So those, so those are the criteria we took to understand different industries that we selected. Uh, quite uh, rigorously done in terms of uh, uh, classification and selecting these industries. Now we selected 47 managers from four different industries which gave us our valuable time. Now one thing is that we have managers from different levels of management. We have 19 senior managers, 15 mid-level managers, and around 13 junior managers. So it's a quite a good mix. So what we figured out is, of course, uh, almost across industries, it is believed that 90% well, of them believe that you know customer churn is a major consequence of service failure, which is great. So our uh, kind of uh, what our hunch was kind of established. Three commonly employed recovery strategies were compensation, turnaround time, and courtesy. I'll just elaborate a little bit on turnaround time because this term might be a little confusing because different industries use it differently. So turnaround time here I mean is that how quickly we respond to a complaint. It is not that the time it takes to resolve a complaint but how quickly you respond to a complaint. That is what the turnaround time, what we mean here. And of course, courtesy and competition is kind of uh, intuitive to understand. But what is interesting is that there is no consensus about effectiveness of various recovery mechanisms. So within uh, the same company, but at a different level of management, we found different answers. So for example, a senior manager in one telecom company informed me that you know they do not provide any compensation even if there is a failure or failure. 
On the other hand, the junior manager who probably deals with them on a regular basis, they say that they sometimes do provide some extra. So within the company, the policies are not standardized. Even uh, within the same level of management, but across companies, right? If you ask them what is the golden standard in terms of the industry when it comes to providing compensation or turnaround time. So one manager, one set of managers says, well, turnaround time is vital in banking and financial industry. Other set of managers say, no, it is not at all important. You know, people do only, only care about money. So it's, 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 it's very difficult to understand, right, how these uh, different dynamics play out because of such complex nature of this thing. Now, because of all this uh, reason, right, so we decided, so this is, these are the kind of, uh, uh, these are the kind of understanding we have. But there is some kind of agreement about one thing, that emerging markets are different, and what you do in emerging markets should have a more emerging market research. So kind of they believe that what is applied in developed market may not be applicable in emerging markets. So, the manager interviews give us some initial guidance about what we want to do. So we clearly want to uh, dig deeper in this issue. Okay. So if you look at the literature, what has been done till now, so I'll come directly to the point. So if you look at service failure, it's essentially when performance falls below customer's expectations. And service failure, if you look at, they have been divided into two failure types. One is outcome failure and another is process failure. So outcome failure is core service failure, right? So uh, is the final outcome. Process failure on the other hand means that failure in case of the service delivery process. So one addresses what element of the service failure, another other addresses how element of the service failure. And one of the example may be call drop, right? Call drop is a clear example of uh, outcome failure. On the other hand, if you look at delay in activation of a service or internet pack, for example, it will be considered a process failure because at the end of the day, you get the pack, but it took a little longer for it get to you know, activate. So what people say that losses in outcome failure, at least the research done by Smith at all 1999, this is a general marketing research paper, very well written and very well regarded paper in the discipline, which talks about the fact that, you know, it talks about losses are tangible in nature in case of outcome failure. Those in case of process failure, social and psychological in nature. So if you have to provide recovery, so once the failure happens, what actions are you going to take, right? That is what we call a recovery mechanism. What actions am I going to take when failure happens? Now, they, if you want to provide some kind of recovery, then in case of, uh, in case of uh, outcome failure, because there are tangible losses, they argue that you provide tangible recovery option. And in case of process failure, because there are social or psychological losses, you, they argue that you provide a social or psychological recovery option. Okay, so what is a tangible recovery option? Uh, literature suggests that compensation uh, can be a tangible recovery options, providing some kind of a discount coupon or uh, or giving some kind of you know, extra is going to call, uh, give you very good bang for a buck when it comes to outcome failure. When it comes to process failure, on the other hand, because you require social and psycho social psychological uh, recovery. Uh, turnaround time and politeness and courtesy can be more effective in case of uh, in case of process failure. That's what the conventional literature argues, and they call it uh, matching hypothesis in the literature. So the basis for matching hypothesis actually is drawn from a psychological theories of resource exchange. So resource exchange theory, uh, which essentially argues that every resource in this world uh, can be broadly classified in two dimensions. One is how concrete the resource is. And the second is uh, whether it matters, whether the value of the resource exists uh, based on who provides you the resource, okay? So the concreteness and the second dimension is about particularism. It essentially means that who provides you the resource is this important. So let's say for taking for an example of money, right? Money is a great example of something which is very concrete in nature because there is a certain value associated with it. And, uh, and it doesn't matter who provides you the money because value remains the same, right? So that is what uh, that is what is called a very concrete kind of resource and very particularistic kind of resource. Contrary to that, if you take another resource which is such as love, you know, love is one another resource. Okay, so love, for example, a resource it depends upon who provides you the resource, and resource is also highly intangible in nature. Okay, so this is why people say that when one kind of resource dips, that is the matching hypothesis argued. So if you lose a resource which is more particularistic, which is more concrete then you provide compensation, which is also more particularistic, more concrete. So if you lose money, give money. Similarly, if you have tangible failure, you give tangible recovery. 
And also there is this entire idea of mental accounts, which is proposed by Teller. Uh, Teller. And Teller's arguments are essentially the way it is applied that consumers have different kinds of mental accounts. So every everything that you spend uh, doesn't go from one mental account, but it is segregated in your minds. So in terms of service failure recovery, it means that process failure and outcome failure are two mental accounts. And as the failure happen, one type of mental accounts get depleted, and therefore you need those kinds of resources to compensate for it. So therefore, if you have outcome failure, your outcome mental account will deplete. So therefore, you provide compensation, tangible compensation to get along to overcome the challenge. So based on which this matching hypothesis come along, an exchange of proximal resources lead to greater satisfaction. Okay. So just uh, take a pause and let me just recap a little bit what we spoke till now. I said that, you know, till the now literature has spoken about outcome failure and process failure. This distinction is critical because I'm going to come back to it again and again as I go along the, so one is basically what has failed before service failure, another is failure associated with service delivery process. Uh, losses are tangible, losses are social psychological. Because losses are tangible, your recovery should also be tangible. Because losses are social psychological, your recovery should also be social psychological. And therefore, competition is more effective in case of outcome failure. Turnaround time and politeness and courtesy are more important uh, in case of process failure. That's where we are. Right. Now, some scholars actually started questioning this resource access theory itself. And uh, it is sad that we are discussing it today because two years back when I first presented this paper, I had no clue that you know it is going to this particular criticism is going to become valid in all of our lives. So the idea that you know uh, Zul Parashuraman and their conceptual paper proposed, and they say that well, well, is it true that you know always process failure should be dealt with apology? And the analogy they gave, and it is so valid today, they said that if there is a poor consumer, he or she may wait in a long queue for a long time, right? just to get some small bit of compensation. So despite the fact that they might have few process failure, this cause, these consumers may be just waiting there to get outcome recovery. They just need uh, some kind of uh, some kind of money because they don't have it. So that's the idea, basically, okay? And, uh, and I build on that and I said, okay, yes. So what is missing in resource constraint? And I started questioning resource constraint theory, resource exchange theory, saying that you, you ignore what is known as resource constraint. So broadening what Parashuraman and, and Zhu and Parashuraman said, and I uh, try to, uh, we try to broaden this research by saying that, well, it is not that there are some resources which are lesser or less abundant in nature, but there are some resources which are more abundant in nature. In a sense, that some resources are scarce and other resources are abundant. So if there's an abundant resource, even you provide me that resource again and again, I may not feel happy. On the other hand, if there's a scarce resource, and even if I don't need it, and if you provide me a little bit of that resource, I'm going to be really, really happy about it, okay? So this is what we introduce in this particular bunch of literature. And, uh, and, and that is where the research goes from there. Especially if you look at emerging markets and then set up my research question, that why emerging market, there is a new research which is required, is because in emerging markets, they are different. How they are different? First of all, they are different structurally. So structural difference in emerging markets, uh, as we said, actually, who recently got uh, uh, Padma Vibhushan or something? I think Padma Vibhushan. Uh, he actually, or Padma Shri, I forgot. So he, he just said that, you know, there are four different dimensions. And the dimensions where emerging markets are different from developed markets are, number one is market heterogeneity, the rich and poor gap. One percent of the population has access to around 70% uh, of the resource pool, 60 or 70% of the resource pool. Secondly, there are a lot of unbranded competition. So because there are unbranded competition, the quality parameters goes for a toss. The quality goes for a toss. Third, there is, of course, socio-political turmoil in emerging markets, which is much more as compared to developed markets. And fourth, there are resource constraints, okay? Resource constraints and infrastructural challenges. So infrastructure, they are not developed. So these four characteristics structurally segregates an emerging market from a developed market. Now, culturally also, if you look at emerging markets, these are different. So how culturally we are different from developed market? Well, uh, there's a very famous paper by Bugras and Steen Camp 2006 IGRM, where they talk about the fact that two dimensions, hierarchy and embeddedness. So it's a hierarchical culture. Most emerging markets are hierarchical in nature. So group identity becomes important and group hierarchies become important. And people are very closely knitted, closely embedded. 
And because curricular closely the embedded, it's important that everybody wants to keep the group structure, uh, keep on keep, keep the group, uh, keep on uh, embedded, keep embedded in the group. So because we're embedded in the group, you don't want the group to break. So you are going to act not, not based on your wills and desires, but based on how the group remains the same. So it's because structurally we have this problem of money and small small fraction of the population having access to large pool of resources. Money is a highly scarce resource. Again, because of cultural reasons, because there is this entire idea of group harmony and you want to keep the group together, some resources such as politeness, courtesy, paying, you know, uh, paying respect to elders, paying respect to other group members, kind of become highly important in emerging markets. So what happens is that what we argue in the paper is money is a scarce resource and love, uh, politeness, courtesy, these are kind of a, a more abundant resource. And that abundant scarcity is what we use to build our hypothesis going forward. So research questions, of course, we want to look at is there a differential effect of uh, uh, different types of failure and customer churn in emerging market that effect in the recovery mechanism vary based on different types of failure in emerging market. Uh, so we use the theories of expectation. So expectations uh, are standards against which you judge a performance. Uh, expectation depends upon perceived alternatives available in the market. I argued already that emerging markets structurally have a lot of unbranded competition. So alternatives that you have availed, that you have access to, or can be of lower quality uh, than culture. Uh, and then, of course, resource constraints. So this will form the consumer's expectations in terms of service failure and recovery. So what kind of recovery consumer expect? So my first hypothesis is basically types of failure in customer churn. And why would you argue that in case of outcome failure, as you remember, if we say, if you, if you remember what we talked about outcome failure, we said in case of outcome failure, uh, it is the core service failure. So the outcome of the service, the core service failure, what has failed, okay? So if it is an outcome failure, what we argue that it is uh, consumer expectations of recovery are low. That means, you know, they're because they're chronic sources of resources and poor infrastructure, you're going to face outcome failure all the time. And because they are poor quality of available alternatives, the next alternative they'll switch to is also not going to be very good. I still remember, uh, you know, in, in in I am Bangalore, we used to have this joke, you know, that floating around. And they will ask you, you know, what, what, is, what service provider do you have, right? Do you use uh, Airtel, Vodafone, or that time Geo was not there, but Airtel, Vodafone, that's a common. And the, uh, then, and, the, and the students will typically say, it doesn't matter. Everybody is equally bad because you are not going to hear anything because your call will constantly drop, okay? And there's such a bad network quality for each of them. And the reason is basically not because the service providers are not sincere, because the infrastructure challenges are quite huge. Okay, setting up a tower is kind of very difficult, right? So therefore, the next alternative that you might have access to is also also like kind of poor. And you, and if you are in a college canteen, right, you understand this, right? The available alternative in a college may be really really poor. So that goes across emerging markets, across different services. So that's why we believe that no, the outcome failure. That's a hypothesis. The outcome failure in case of uh, in, in case of outcome failure, recovery expectations are low. Contrary to that, if you look at process failure, right? Uh, well, this is kind of a different beast because if you, uh, because process failure associated with social losses and social losses in case of when it comes to emerging market is kind of very dangerous because it goes against the cultural norms of the emerging market, which is about hierarchy and embeddedness. So one might argue based on that, that if there's a process failure, it is not acceptable. Give you an example of a process failure, for example, rude behavior, can be an example of a process failure. It is not acceptable in the emerging market. Okay, of course, it's not acceptable in any market, more so in emerging markets. And so, therefore, we will say the likelihood of customer churn is greater in case of process failure as compared to outcome failure. So, this is our central hypothesis. Uh, then we say that if you, there is a failure that has happened, how do you recover? So, if you remember in the qualitative research section, I said managers use three different kinds of recovery strategies. First of all, compensation. Now, if you use compensation, well, uh, because money is a scarce resource and this utility of a resource is determined by scarcity of the resource. So, uh, and therefore what will happen is that compensation will be effective no matter what kind of failure you face. However, when it comes to uh, process failure, it will be much more effective as compared to outcome failure. This is because when process failure happens, consumers are not looking for a tangible compensation. They were not looking for a tangible recovery option. 
So if we give them a tangible recovery option, which they like, uh, which is basically scarce in nature, consumers may feel delighted about it. So delight, as you know, is the emotion of surprise, okay? I'm not expected, you know, all of a sudden I got 100 rupees. It's kind of delight, right? So therefore, consumers will feel delighted because in case of process failure, they were not expecting any kind of compensation at all. So therefore, it will be more effective in case of process failure as compared to outcome failure, right? So compensation is more effective in reducing customer churn in case of process failure as compared to outcome failure. Uh, just to give you, uh, going back to example, so if there's an internet pack that has not got activated, and if you give some kind of compensation, consumers are less likely to churn as compared to, you know, uh, in case of a call drop. So this is what the first, uh, hypo second hypothesis is. Now, when it comes to politeness and courtesy, uh, these are all uh, desirable traits in emerging markets. Uh, these are relatively abundant as compared to money because of the cultural nature of emerging markets. Uh, so, but these are going to be very less effective in case of outcome failure because consumers are expecting some kind of tangible compensation. So politeness and courtesy will be more effective in reducing customer churn in case of process failure as compared to outcome failure. So if you say politeness and courtesy will be more effective uh, in case of delayed activation of internet pack rather than a call drop. Okay, because in call drop there's a tangible loss, so it doesn't matter uh, whether you talk politely or not. So that's right. Turnaround time, it turns out to be a different kinds of uh, different, uh, very interesting variable. So if you look at turnaround time, it signals two things. First of all, if I solve your problem quickly, you might feel that I'm giving, uh, I'm putting customer on a higher pedestal. So if you have complained to me, I solve it quickly, you might feel, wow, you know, this company actually values relationship with me. So therefore, turnaround time might send a signal like this. Also, it also shows that you are of high quality because I, have, I can fix the problem quickly. So there are both in terms of uh, importance and high quality. So because you are putting customer uh, at a higher pedestrian, it can be important in case of process failure. On the other hand, because it's of high quality, it might be very effective in case of outcome failure. Uh, so there, we don't expect any differential effect in terms of turnaround time on customer churn based on types of failure. So this is my conceptual framework. I'll just make a quick recap. What we said that failures are of two types, outcome failure and process failure. Process failure, failure associated service delivery process, outcome failures are failures associated with the core service failure. In case of, we argue that process failure will have higher likelihood of customer churn as compared to outcome failure because outcome failures are more likely to occur in emerging markets because of, the, because of various reasons, including poor infrastructure. And compensation will be effective in case of both, but more so in case of process failure because consumers are not expecting a kind of tangible recovery. Politeness and courtesy on the other hand will be very effective in case of process failure as compared to outcome failure. Same with turnaround time, we do not uh, suppose any differential. So I will take a pause here because I think I have reached in terms of I have set up the problem nicely uh, in terms of now we know what kind of questions we are trying to answer, what is the conceptual framework. And if you have any questions, right, you should ask me some questions. So in the chat window, uh, uh, if you can ask me a question, okay. How is this study conducted physical meeting, phone call, or email? Well, it is conducted, uh, well, it is conducted uh, uh, through, through phone calls primarily, but there were some physical meetings, but more or less phone calls, more or less phone calls, yeah. And is there any other question? What is this sign positive, negative means? Okay. So if you look at negative, this negative sign, so the positive signs means higher likelihood of churn. So customers will leave. So if two positive signs means it's much more likely. And negative signs mean this, this likelihood of churn is going to come down if we provide compensation, solve it quickly, or we are going to provide politeness and courtesy. Yes. Uh, a delay in delivery dominoes presents the process failure or the outcome failure. Well, it is in the service delivery process. So it is going to be a process failure, yes. Uh, how is it applicable for B2B scenario? Okay, so I have not made a distinction between type of industry or nature of industry. Failure recoveries are common across. Okay, so I don't see it changing. I don't have a very good theoretical reason uh, to, uh, to, to, to to not say it's, it's, it's uh, a B2B versus B2C. I don't see it very different. Uh, there's one more question. Did you, rep, uh, what was that? Uh, is there an impact of uh, repeated transaction? Oh, it's a great question, actually. 
repeated transactions. A repeated transaction is a great question. We don't look at repeated transaction here, uh, but I have another paper which I'm working right now. First time it may be a delight. Who asked this question, Akshay? Okay, it's a great question. So this is the second paper that I'm working on right now, which is my second essay turned out to be, okay? You don't want to give everything in one paper, okay? <laughs> you can get it. How did you record these meetings? Uh, how the responses were recorded? We, 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 we audio taped the interviews and then we started coding them. And there's something known as thematic coding. So basically once you code, you kind of try to develop some kind of theme. Uh, very famous paper by King, 2012. Uh, it's a grounded theory, similar to grounded theory kind of approach. So that's what we did. What percentage of compensation is acceptable to stop customer churn? That is another a great question. In the, in, the, in the data that we have access to, which I'm going to show you later, you will see that, you know, uh, generally companies have this 50%, 100%, 0% slab. So in a sense that zero to 50 is considered to be one slab. 50 to 100 is another slab. So that's the way companies, more, the companies they gave us data access. It. Yeah, yeah. But it's a good question. When does it plateau down, okay? Yeah, so it, theoretically actually what happens is that if you give too much of compensation that some scholars argue that it is bad because consumers get used to uh, lot and their expectations keep rising. And as a result of which you may not feel delighted anymore. So that's, I think, uh, theoretically, some people have started. Liao 2012 is one paper that tried to do that. Any other question in terms of the framework, in terms of this? Fair enough. Okay, so since you have, okay, so, all right. So let me move on and then just show you what we have done in terms of data. So we went to the field and there's a very, uh, one telecom service provider, uh, which we cannot name in public, uh, but they gave us the data. They give, uh, uh, so what happens is that when there's a failure that happens, you give a call to the customer service executive, right? So once you call, they say that the call will be recorded for quality purposes. Those calls are kind of, you know, recorded and they get a transcript. And then they uh, try to uh, say what can, what is the reason for your call. And after the call is over, they also track you for some time. Sometimes they send you a message saying that if you are satisfied with the call, uh, type zero. And then, you know, if you, uh, if your problem has been resolved, type two, so something like that. So you get this idea transaction. So that data we had access to. Uh, they gave us data for like 550 of such consumers, 113 of that churn, which is around 20%. Uh, following service failure and recovery. Uh, we did a binary logic model because this failure recovery is zero one. And then we coded everything. The coding has been done based on literature as well as expert recommendation. So some connectivity release call drops, uh, network coverage, billing. So sometimes what happens is the wrong billing and then customer accounting. This we call it outcome failure. Process failure is a bill delivery. We did not leave it on time. There are provisioning related issues. We call them uh, process failure. So these are our results. So well, field data has brilliant results. So in a sense that we do find that process failure leads to higher likelihood of churn. So next time when you have a service failure, we make sure that you know, if there's a process failure, do something about it. And what should you do? If you provide them compensation, they will be very happy, okay? We do not explicitly hypothesize, but you see that you know the question that someone raised, what is the level? So a medium level of compensation, which is around 50%, okay? 50% uh, of the bill value, uh, that seems to work magically. If you give higher compensation, they don't mind, but you don't get that much bang for the buck. Uh, politeness and courtesy, we again find in case of process failure, it is more important as compared to outcome failure, which is bound to be the case. Very interestingly, turnaround time seems to be very important in case of outcome failure as compared to process failure. So which actually we did not hypothesize. We thought that turnaround time is going to have equally effective both in case of process and outcome failure. Okay, so this is kind of very interesting result that they found out, which is contrary to what we hypothesized. But field data have certain problems, okay? Uh, well, we do look at real churn, we do look at real results, but the problem with field data is number one, we do not observe customer expectations. Because what we argued is the customer expectation is the reason why it's happening, but we don't observe it. There are multiple variables that are not observed. So people have talked about gender before, People have talked about whether customer has failed failure before. What is the frequency of users? Like, is it a regular user, heavy user, low user? 
severity of failure is another thing that we don't observe. Okay, so these are things that we don't observe. But the most important thing is there are some consumers who are less likely to complain. Okay, and they might still churn. So I may not give you a call, I just leave the service provider. Especially those consumers, we do not have any data, right? So our data is kind of biased because we only observe those consumers which are more vocal. We call and then we leave, okay? So, some, so that is kind of the problem. So therefore, to remove this bias and to understand whether customer expectation is the reason why it is happening, then we do the, did a small experiment. Actually, we did two experiments. First experiment was a taxi service. It also helped us to generalize ability. Help us to generalize. In a sense, the taxi service is very different from a mobile service provider, right? So the, the difference comes that you directly meet the service provider. That's the biggest difference you have. Okay, so a best taxi service. So that's what we wanted to have. And we have two different kinds of scenarios. In case of outcome failure scenario, we call people to the laboratory and tell them that you have booked a taxi to go to the airport. And you book the AC, AC taxi along with Wi-Fi services. But when the taxi came, it was not the same taxi. And we, uh, it, was, it doesn't have Wi-Fi, doesn't have, uh, it, it doesn't have Wi-Fi, and not, not only that, it doesn't have any kind of uh, uh, AC. So therefore, this is what we consider as outcome failure. When it comes to process failure, we talk about inattentive service, which essentially means that you, know, uh, uh, you have booked a safe cab, the cab has come, but the driver is not paying attention to you. Say, so switch on the, turn on the AC, he doesn't listen to you. So this is what we call, you know, inattentive services. And then we said, you know, you reached the airport and decided to complain. Now, once you complain, uh, in some case, you get 100% refund. Another case, you get 50% refund. And third case, company do not provide you any refund. And the company did it, the refund has been provided very quickly. Within 10 minutes time, company got back to you. So in some cases, it's slower. It took another three hours. In some cases, company executives are very polite, allows you to complete, say sorry all the time. Other cases, the company executives are a little rude to you. So we didn't given this scenario what happens. So if you look at the data, so it is 136 respondents were here. The 480 MBA students, uh, 136 were female, 344 were male. 134 out of 480 respondents reported intention to churn and participants were assigned to either outcome or process failure condition. So it's a clear three cross two cross two design uh, which is like a conventional experimental design. And what do you find? Well, if you look at both this field data and experiment, right, you will see almost similar results. Almost similar results. In fact, if you look at, you know, uh, uh, most of the cases, we do not find any differences. Our process failure leads to higher likelihood of churn. We find compensation is very effective in case of process failure as compared to outcome failure. Politeness and courtesy is very important in case of process failure. And similarly to our earlier results and contrary to what we hypothesized, we find that turnaround time actually has a positive effect in case of outcome failure as compared to process failure. So this is what we find uh, in, case of, in case of field data. But here also we find there are certain limitations, okay? But before I go to the limitations, we, I also said that we want to test whether expectation is the reason why people are churning or not. We do find that recovery expectation in case of process failure is higher as compared to outcome failure, as we hypothesize. So therefore, if there's a pizza delivery service and the person comes late, you expect the company to do something. Okay, so therefore, this is what the, this is what the process failure is expected. Also, but consumers believe that process failures are controllable by the firm. Okay, if, a, if an employee shows rude behavior, consumers believe that you, know, you should have been able to control the employee. So it's controllable by the firm, whereas outcome failure, because it happens, because infrastructure and challenges and all, it may not be uh, controllable by the firm. That's what uh, most consumers say. But again, this uh, app-based taxi services are quite new, okay? So it may be many customers do not know. And of course, there are a lot of small villages and small towns where they may not use it. Our second problem with experiment uh, one is basically we only looked at uh, student samples, okay? So these are basically MBA students who filled up my survey. And uh, you know, some scholars argue that you know they are not sincere enough while filling up the survey because you go to the classroom, give them to fill up, and they may be thinking about something else, and they may not be consumers uh, at all. Uh, they may not be consuming these services regularly, which we defy. But yeah, the reviewers are quite adamant that we need to do one more round of experiments. So to mitigate this concern, we did one more round of experiments, and this is in the restaurant industry. Uh, restaurant industry is similar to your uh, your taxi service in terms of that you meet the service provider, okay? 
So we took a restaurant service, again, 480 students, but here we did this in a small town. Okay, and here regular respondents took part. So we want to, uh, we want to negate all the criticism that we had in the earlier round in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, using student as a sample. And we did it, and here we again gave them, you know, uh, outcome failure as a restaurant, you went to a restaurant for a lunch, and you ordered some item, the item was not available. Process failure, we said that there is delay in service. Again, if you look at the results, these are the results from all three different experiments, okay? So what we find is that, you know, some certain things are definitely all across, is that outcome, process failure leads to higher likelihood of churn. We also find that uh, compensation is more effective in case of process failure as compared to outcome failure. Also find that politeness and courtesy is kind of more effective in case of process failure. Uh, we do find some different results when it comes to turnaround time. Apart from the restaurant case, other cases we find that uh, it is, it is uh, in case of uh, outcome failure, turnaround time kind of uh, is a good, uh, good recovery strategy. So this is what we show in our paper. Uh, just to revisit what we are, uh, what we have found out, we said that process failure leads to higher likelihood of churn as compared to outcome failure, higher recovery expectation in case of process failure, and also people perceive the process failures are controllable by the form. Uh, the effectiveness, we have just said compensation and politeness and courtesy is more effective in case of process failure in emerging market. Now, contribution to theory, well, our first contribution is this is a first paper which kind of distinguishes and established uh, that, you know, one type of failure is more important than other in emerging markets. So no research prior to us has done that. So therefore, this is our first contribution. Our second contribution, which is the core contribution, I believe, the paper is basically the resource access theory. So importance of resource constraints, okay? And I... Uh, when we, my, my, uh, my advisor, uh, who is the co-author in the paper, famously used to tell me all the time that what your paper has published, that you know, love can be traded for money, okay? So it's kind of that. It's basically your importance of resource constraint. If some resources are constrained, you will try to get rid of scarcity, so you are going to trade abundant resources. And then, of course, matching hypothesis does not hold true in resource constraint environment. In fact, what we have shown that uh, if, Money is actually more important, compensation is more important in case of outcome failures, a process failure as compared to outcome. Contribution to practice. Well, uh, first of all, uh, first contribution is whatever companies are adopting till now is try to reduce outcome failure. So most telecom service providers you talk to and most service companies talk to, they talk about the fact that we should reduce the radiation in outcome. So, but what happens is that in emerging market it seems, to, it seems not to be the case. We should be focusing more towards reducing process failure. So this is what our first contribution to practice. Secondly, uh, we talked that you know you should match with expectations and not with failures, because most of them are matching now failure recovery kind of scenario. But what we say that you look at expectation and see what kind of failure consumer has, what kind of expectation. And finally, invest in behavioral guidelines. So it's very easy if you have an IVR kind of a transaction. You can, the person calls and now you can make sure that the person goes to whether he complains for process or outcome, he can be sent to one particular operator and you can create champions in there in handling them. So this is basically, this guideline thing is now getting implemented is one telecom service provider who is currently one of my students who is basically interning here has now started implementing this, the third, uh, third phase. So basically some level of implementation of this research that is still going on right now. Yeah, so this is more or less all from my part. Uh, now I can take any further questions that you have uh, in terms of, yeah. So let me just, <coughs> oh, no research is done across, yes, there is no research across emerging markets. So see this, okay. So when you say, when someone said there is no research across emerging markets, what does it mean? It essentially means that you have to build on characteristics of emerging markets. Okay, so in a sense that something that different in emerging market that might suspect that, you know, the research is, uh, the findings may be different. So you might say I have done the study in India, actually it doesn't add up anything if you do not have the reason and underlying reason why we should be looking at emerging market differently. So that's, that's what it is. Oh, so what kind of statistical test I conducted? So in a sense that the, 
primarily it's a, a binary regression. So in a sense that it's a logic model, binary logic model. Uh, so that's what we do when we have a dependent variable, which is zero or one kind of a nature. So it's a binary logic model, simple binary logic. Yeah. No, uh, so that's what that's what going to give the beta coefficients are going to give you what is more important than the other. So that's what we need. Yes. Yes. Anything else? Don't you think that within emerging market failure? Very good question. Absolutely great question by Samrat. So. Uh, do I think emerging market will be heterogeneous in nature within? Yes. I have one paper that recently got published in Journal of Business Research, where I say emerging markets are heterogeneous. However, however, within this context, right? Within this context, do I think that heterogeneity might affect? I don't think so. Okay, I don't think so. However, if point is well taken, that emerging market, within emerging market, there is heterogeneity. And the paper that I have done recently, which got published in JBR, there I look at multiple emerging markets. I think around 12 or so emerging markets that will look at. Oh, how do you select those uh, manager? That is another uh, good question. So, so it's basically a old question of you know qualitative research, right? How do you select? Uh, so of course you need managers who is responsible for uh, so somebody who is responsible for customer satisfaction. Okay, so somebody who is uh, responsible for uh, customer management, right? So that is the first criteria we use. We use the person should be using, uh, be servicing, uh, which have an experience of at least five years. Five years experience in service management, okay? Five years experience, okay? So first number one is of course the person should have been responsible, it should be a client facing role, customer facing role, responsible for customer satisfaction, should have five years of experience at least, and must oversee emerging market business. Okay, so these are the three criteria based on which we selected. We initially had a list of 72 managers, but all of them uh, could not take part. Therefore, we can somehow do only for this. Process failure impacts are more than outcome failure. Hence, there is a potential contribution through customer interaction. How technology can be intervene? Okay, chatbot. Yeah, okay. So clearly, uh, technology can intervene. So that's what I say. So if you do an IVR kind of, right? So if somebody calls, and the person calls say that, okay, uh, this is the, so I am calling you because the driver was very rude. Let's say who called the app uh, desk process service. So this guy is clearly a process service failure candidate. If we can, if we can somehow direct that person, right? Uh, towards the, uh, towards the appropriate little uh, highly rated executives who can take care of the person, that will be very helpful. Chatbots can be a very good idea as soon as the person type, if we can clarify, uh, classify them outcome versus process and send it to, and take action based on that, I think that will be a great idea uh, to pursue. I don't know if any company is doing it. Only company I know of who is doing it right now, the company that you know, uh, that, that my student is currently implementing. That's not uh, context of dealing with less of a loss aversion criteria by the customer and choosing between different service recovery tools. Uh, is there a theoretical context of mental accounting? Uh, 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 Loss aversion. Okay, so if you go by Teller's idea of loss aversion and recovery cues, uh, there is some research on that. Okay, so not directly, but people do talk about you know uh, uh, different kinds of things. However, loss aversion, I don't know whether it will be able to capture. I, I'm not very familiar with uh, you know loss aversion prospect theory. I know a little bit, uh, but that's not my area of research. But more or less, if I say that loss aversion, it will be difficult to differentiate based on loss aversion emerging versus development. Because if you look at all the evidences till we have till now, it doesn't matter whether you are in the United States or whether you are in India. Okay, loss aversion seems to be more universal in nature. Okay, so maybe there can be a, uh, there can be a customer level heterogeneity that might be captured. Okay, so can knowledge of any customer play a role? I agree that's the limitation of the paper uh, that you know it's only one first time failure uh, help the customer face failure before we control for that. Uh, we don't find any significant results, but I'm now doing a paper on repeat failure. The data has already been collected and I think the results are also out there. So just to give a heads up on that research, what we find is that uh, compensation is very highly valued when it's a second failure or third failure. Okay, when the first failure, uh, first failure happens, uh, they don't care much about compensation. And they want the failure to uh, they want the apology. So that's the kind of idea that we are working on. 
but it's very preliminary results, okay? I might need to dissect it any further. Oh, yeah, so there are, there, there is many ways you can uh, capture customer expectations. There is modeling route, you can do a Bayesian modeling kind of stuff that you can capture customer expectation uh, uh, in resolving the immediate failure, that is correct. You can do that. That's what we are trying to planning to do next, where we try to, you know, say that the okay, first time you come, you have some kind of a prior. You think this is how the service will look like. And you go and then they've got this big bad service and you say, wow, man, this is how services are not like this. This is how it should look like. So your, your distribution uh, from which your priors are extracted is going to get changed. Uh, and then that becomes your next time that's become the going to become your prior. So that's what we try to do, we are trying to do right now. But that is a very preliminary stage. So I won't comment on it right now, but as we go along, I'll update. Hmm. Yeah, it's see. See, so this is uh, this is uh, uh, outside the scope of the paper, uh, but there is there is uh, research on social media that people have looked at, and he said that what what if the person complains in social media? What do you do then? Okay, and do you do you do a kind of quickly turn around? Uh, do you wait for some time, provide some kind of a coupon? Because if you provide some kind of a coupon in social media, what might happen is everybody else will come for a coupon, right? So you don't want that to happen. Everybody say, oh, I, I am not satisfied with the service. Give me money, right? So, and you will be, hopefully, you will be shrewd enough to not do it. Uh, so, so, so social media's role has been discussed, but I am not very, you know, I, I think, you know, the better off way to do it is basically in social media, you ask the consumer to talk to you and then try to resolve it that way. Social media is another form of, you know, expressing your views or making a complaint, that's it, and another channel. So that's where I will keep it. Yeah, so it is possible. That it is possible, and and if you look at the if you look at yeah, that is a good question. Basically, that's what I said. Some consumer are more likely to complain than others, so therefore some consumer must may not have uh, may not have complained and they have left. And that's why you do this scenario-based experiment, right? Where you try to uh, try to understand, you know, um, more in details. Even if the consumers don't complain, they will at least have this scenario-based experiment. It will come. Up. So that's not a concern in terms of if you want to raise a concern. Yeah, I understand the point, but it is not not a problem in my research because I have multiple methods. So I will I generally take care of that issue. Yes. Okay. Anything else? Great. So. So I think uh, we can wrap up the presentation. Uh, it was very interesting presentation. Uh, I would like to thank. Uh, Professor uh, Saurabh Bora and all the participants for the great questions. Um, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.